Morning, ladies and gentlemen. There have been a lot of representations made to the ministry for the reduction in corporate tax rate. In fact, I remember reading that one of the partners of the Big Four actually made a proposal to reduce corporate tax rate to 15%. That was not to be because corporate tax rate remains at 17%. Actually, my opinion is a corporate tax rate of anything between 20 and 25% is a reasonable rate. So at 17, we are actually very low. And if we look at countries around us, our major trading partners, you can see that except for Hong Kong, which is at 16 and a half, all the rest would be above us. So we are the same as Taiwan. Thailand is 23, clustering at 25. China, Malaysia, Indonesia, UK. India, 30. US, 35. And Obama has made a statement to say that he is planning to reduce corporate tax rate to 28%. So you have a cluster at around the mid-twenties, and we are almost like 10 percentage point below. However, our perpetual part competitor is Hong Kong, and, and there is always a comparison with Hong Kong. They still complain that we are half a percentage more than Hong Kong. Honestly, a half percentage point is neither here nor there. Because at the end of the day, the costs of doing business is more important. And all of us know the cost of rental in Hong Kong is 50% higher than Singapore. The salary cost in Hong Kong is 50% higher than Singapore. So when we take all those into consideration, Singapore is actually a more business-friendly country to do business. I have put that island because over the last few years, there were also representations made to, min to the ministry that we should be bold enough to follow Ireland because Ireland actually slashed its corporate tax from 30% to 12.5%. And it was so-called the Celtic Tiger, growing phenomenally. But that was up to 2007. Now nobody talks about Ireland because Ireland is effectively bankrupt. But we also, not, probably not we, the people who propose that we follow Ireland conveniently forget that whereas the corporate tax rate is 12.5% in Ireland, the VAT in Ireland is actually 21%. We are already complaining about GST at 7%. So we should look at the whole package. It's just like we have been deliberating about the minister's pay, right? Because they also conveniently forgot to tell us they were pensionable in the past. <laughs> now, when we look at our headline tax rate of 17%, our effective rate for profits of up to <coughs> 1 million is actually a lot lower. And that's because of our partial exemption. All entities are entitled to the partial exemption, which works out to 152,500, because the first 300,000 will qualify for partial exemption. So, taking into account partial exemption and not yet taking into account the 5,000 cash grant, at 300,000, our effective rate is 8.4%, half a million. 11.8, and even at a million, it's 14.4%. More than two percentage points lower than Hong Kong. 
So we are actually very competitive as far as corporate tax rate is concerned. So probably the government should be looking at more cost of doing business. Last year, we also had an SME cash grant, but that was $10,000 or 20% of tax payable, whichever is the lower, or whichever is the higher, 20%, but the maximum rebate cash grant was up to $10,000. That has been reduced this year to $5,000, as the Minister Tan Lak has mentioned, but we no longer compare with tax payable. It is just 5,000 or 5% 5 of revenue, whichever is the lower. So if you look at two examples, A limited revenue 1.2 million, 5% is 60,000, maximum grant 5,000, we will get a grant of 5,000. B revenue 75,000, 5% 3750, max is 5,000, we get 3750. And please note that the cash grant will be available if we have at least one worker contributing to CPF, and that worker should not be the substantial shareholder. Well, I was also asked, well, how do we define SME? In fact, SME is a misnomer. All entities will be entitled to the cash grant. PIC is a big thing, the Productivity and Innovation Credit. This was introduced two years ago in 2010, and it was very substantially enhanced last year. So right now, the PIC is worth a lot of money. So because it is based on 400% enhanced deduction for up to 400,000 of spending per activity. So we have six activities there. So if we spend and maximize on all the six, we have 2.4 million and 2.4 million at 400%. That's a lot of subsidy that the government is, is looking at. And if you can see, this is specifically targeted as, at, at SME. Because when we look at multinationals, as far as R&D is concerned, they will be spending millions. But SMEs, we don't, normally they don't do very much as R&D. So now, the government is trying to encourage SMEs to do R&D, to enhance its productivity, to enhance its business innovation, hence the very substantial and very generous deduction. When PIC was introduced, there was a cash conversion possibility. But the cash conversion was 30,000 for up to 100,000 of qualifying expenditures. So if we spend 100,000, we can convert it to cash of 30,000. That gives us an effective conversion rate of 7.5%. Because at, at 100,000 times 4, we have 400,000 worth of deductions. So converting to 30,000, our effective conversion rate is 7.5%. So not that attractive because our base corporate tax rate is 17. So we would rather have a 400,000 deductible at 17% than to convert it to cash at the uh, rate of 7.5%. Again, feedbacks have been received. So now the minister has proposed that the conversion will be worth 60,000. Still 100,000 maximum conversion, but the conversion is 60,000. Now the conversion rate is 15% because 400,000 converted to 60,000 cash 
there is a conversion rate of 15%. This is effective from YA 13 onwards and initially now the PIC is good for 5 years, YA 11 to YA 15. Question, how attractive is this conversion? So I've done some simple computations. Now, first example here, I'm looking at situation where we don't want a conversion and we have a cash conversion. So without the conversion, if we spend 100,000 on qualifying expenditures, we will get 400,000 deduction. So net chargeable, 300,000, less of partial exemption, 147,500 at 17% gives us 25,075. But if we have converted 100,000, we would have no deduction, less of partial exemption, net chargeable, 547,500 at 17% gives us tax liability of 93,075. But we have converted cash of 60,000. So now our net tax payable is 33,075, which is higher than our tax payable without conversion, higher by $8,000. Our chargeable income before PIC is 600,000. Then the situation is slightly different because after deduction, our tax and partial exemption, our tax is 97,500. Our chargeable income 97,500, tax 16,575. But with a cash conversion, our tax will be. 76,075, but we receive cash grant of 60,000. So our net tax is 16,075. We are better off with a cash conversion by $500. But if our income falls to 500,000, now we will be a lot better off because we actually had a net gain. We have tax liability of 59,075, but we receive cash of 60. So we have a net cash return of 925, as opposed to tax payable by claiming PIC of 8,075. So now we are better off by $9,000. If our profit fall to 400,000, then it's even more distinct. No tax to pay if we do not convert because all our profits have been fully set off against our PIC spending. But with a conversion, now we actually have a net cash inflow of 17,925. So at the lower level, we should take advantage of the cash conversion. And this point actually had not been fully emphasized by the authorities because if I were at the parliament when people complained, I would emphasize that look, corporate tax rate, not only is it low, but because of the PIC, you are actually very well off. And that's where the the government is very serious about upgrading the skills because effectively with a 400% deduction, every dollar that a company spends on PIC, the government is actually funding 68 cents because it is 400%. So for a dollar spent, you are only spending 32 cents. So you can see that the government actually is very serious in collaborating with companies and industry to upgrade productivity and innovation. And the cash conversion has also been extended to YA 14 and 15 
because initially when the cash conversion was introduced, it was only good for three years. YA 11, 12, 13. Now it has been extended to the full period of the PIC. Last year when IRAs issued the guide on cash conversion, it very clearly indicated that if we want to have cash conversion on equipment, then if we purchase the equipment under higher purchase and the higher purchase period straddles more than one accounting period, then cash conversion will not be available. So again, after feedbacks, the government has now acceded to the request that even for equipment purchase under HP that straddles more than one accounting period, cash conversion is available. The thing to note about cash conversion, if we are using equipment for cash conversion, the cash conversion is equipment by equipment. So if we purchase an automation equipment costing us 120,000 and we convert it, we actually lose 20,000 because the max conversion is 100, the excess 20,000 is gone. So when we want to convert, we should convert equipment, if it's equipment, costing not more than 100,000. Better still, if we convert our spending, R&D spending, training. Whereas equipment, be careful because you may lose your excess over 100,000. So choose the smaller items for conversion. And relaxation of training, and this is actually only applicable for in-house training because honestly when they introduced the PIC and said in-house training is also qualifying expenditure for PIC, I felt that it's actually a very generous proposal. So actually all of us within this room should consciously embark on a lot of internal training because it's worth 400%. And recognizing that you have to be accredited by the WDA or ITE, it's a bit cumbersome, especially for SME. Hence, the relaxation that if you spend up to 10,000, you do not need prior accreditation from WDA or ITE. Of course, if you spend more than that, you will need accreditation. The other thing is that if it's external training, then it's a free for all. That's why I, I was telling the president that ICPAS is now in an incredible position because when you come and attend CPE, you can actually get 400% deduction. And also, don't forget, send your staff as well. So we maximize on the deduction. In the past, R&D cost sharing will not, would not have qualified for PIC, but recognizing that there is a slight conflict because we actually liberalized the R&D deduction for cost sharing last year. So now the minister has proposed that even for R&D cost sharing, PIC would be available, but the amount qualifying for the 400% deduction will be 60% of the R&D cost share. Because when we look at R&D deduction for PIC, we actually get the 400% for salaries and wages and consumables. Now, real estate investment trusts distribution. For REITs, IRAs, has granted a tax transparency. In other words, instead of taxing the trusts, the trust will be transparent. IRAs will see through the trusts and tax the unit holders. But the tax transparency is only available if at least 90% of taxable income of the REIT is distributed. And if you have been reading the representations by REIT. REIT has actually made 
some representations to MAS and MOF for reduction in the distribution of taxable income. Of course, the answer from MOF and MAS is no. Because to me, it's ridiculous when you talk to the authorities, give us tax transparency, we will distribute almost everything to unit holders. When you have the transparency, you turn around and say, well, we actually don't need to distribute so much. So at least this time round, MAS made the right decision. It said no. So you must distribute at least 90%. And the change made is that the transparency will still apply if instead of cash distribution, the distribution is in units of the REIT. So if it distributes units, then it is also counted as the 90% distribution. But the proviso is the REIT must provide a choice to unit holders. So if unit holders wants cash, then the REIT cannot say, well, you have no choice. So you, choice must be given, and the REIT must demonstrate that it has sufficient cash to make a cash distribution. Renovation and refurbishment <coughs> expenses. Now this was introduced in, I think, 2003, recognizing that businesses need constant refurbishment, constant renovation. And this is especially so for the F&B industry. Small outlets will have to constantly upgrade themselves. So the 14Q is set to expire next year. But now it has been made permanent and not only that, the amount deductible has been doubled from 150,000 to 300,000. And this is effective for YA13, in other words, now, because this is basis period for YA13. But please note that the minister did not take away the three year rule, because the 150,000 is 150,000 for every three years. So now instead of 150, we, if we spend up to 300,000 every three years, we will get the 14Q deduction. And 14Q is one third of calling qualifying expenses. We have been very successful in pitching ourselves as the maritime hub. In fact, globally, we, we are very renowned as a maritime hub. So in order to make ourselves competitive, a few additional proposals have been put in. First, disposals of ships by qualified operators will be exempt. And this exemption goes back last year with effect from 1st June 2011. Now, when we look at disposal of ships, when you are a ship operator and you dispose of ships, you are already exempt. But the difficulty that ship owners face was that if you were to dispose of ships under construction, then that was not covered. And in the maritime industry, it's not unusual that ships will be disposed of during construction because construction process takes anything between two and three years. So if the market is very bullish, you can sell off your ship and make a lot of money. So with this enhancement, ship owners can actually sell the ships in construction without paying tax on it. Our withholding regime also requires us to withhold tax on the chartering of ships if the ship owner is a non-resident. To overcome that, the MPA has introduced the AIS scheme. So under AIS, you do not need to withhold. But to ensure that we become more competitive, with effect from the budget day itself, 17th February, all charter fees paid will be exempt from withholding. 
So we don't really need to think how we package ourselves to apply for AIS because I have a lot of clients previously that the only objective of applying for AIS is to go around the requirement to withhold tax on charter fees. And we have the containers leasing which is taking off. So to make it more competitive, interest paid on loans for the purchase of contain, for containers and intermediate equipment will also be exempt from withholding tax. We have double deductions under 14B for participation in trade fairs, overseas trade exhibitions and 14K for expenses incurred in overseas investment evaluation. But 14B has to be approved by IE, 14K has to be approved by STB. So now the Minister has proposed to liberalise the claim such that for the first 100,000 of claim, you do not need prior approval from either IE or STB. And this is actually a very welcome move because sometimes we want to participate in a trade fair and that trade fair may not be approved. And the other issue that is of interest is usually even on approval, IE may specify you only expenses of up to three employees will qualify for double deduction. Now with the liberalization for the first 100,000, we may be able to send more people if we think that it's a very important trade fair and all these people will qualify for double deduction. Capital allowance for small items. Up to now, if we purchase items costing us not more than $1,000, we can write off the whole item in the year of purchase. And this is to make compliance easier because it's a hassle to track, for example, if you purchase an item costing $500 and you have to claim it for three years. And that scheme has been very successful. So now the minister has proposed to increase the sum from $1,000 to five thousand dollars. So if you buy anything up to five thousand dollars, you can write it off straight away. But he did not increase the maximum quantum. So the maximum quantum of thirty thousand still remains. Integrated investment allowance scheme. Now Investment allowance is a special incentive granted by EDB. So if we invest in productive plant and equipment, we can apply to EDB for approval of investment allowance. And investment allowance can be up to 100%. But usually EDB will grant us anything between 30 and 50%. It's very difficult to get 100%. And the Minister has introduced this Integrated Investment Allowance Scheme. So basically, if you purchase productive equipment and you need to put this productive equipment, say, in your subcontractor's premises in Batam, you can apply EDB for the incentive investment allowance. At the same time, the Integrated industrial capital allowance has been removed. So this one is the integrated industrial capital allowance, which is not the new incentive created. The IICA, the industrial capital allowance, was introduced quite a few years ago, and that was to allow companies to claim capital allowances if the plant and equipment is overseas, for example, in your subcontractor's premises in Batam or in Johor. I have always felt that the old integrated industrial capital allowances is an unnecessary 
situation because when you read section 19, section 19 actually says expenses incurred in acquisition of plant and equipment for use in your business, you can qualify for the claim of capital allowances. And in fact, last year, there was a case, I'll talk about it again, that the Board of Review actually ruled that the company was entitled to claim capital allowances, so no need to go to EDB for special approval. But the minister did not tell us that. He just said, oh, it's been withdrawn because it's not effective. The Board of Review has overruled it. But the good thing is, now we can get special incentive. So on top of the 100%, if EDB supports our investment and give us 50% IA, then we have a total deduction of 150%. The Minister also proposed to enhance the M&A allowance. The M&A allowance will be available when we have a merger or an acquisition and basically the merger or acquisition must be direct. The acquiring company must acquire the target direct or indirect through a 100% hold held subsidiary. But now the minister has proposed that the sub can be multi-layer sub. Okay. This is to recognize that sometimes for tax planning, especially if we try to avoid capital gains overseas, we want to have multi-tier holding. But with this requirement, it's difficult for us to structure. So now with the multi-tier holding, we are still available eligible for the claim of the M&A allowance, which is up to 5% of 100 million acquisition. Next is when we look at the target, under current arrangements, we either acquire the target directly or the operating subsidiary is 100% subsidiary of the target. Again, now with the enhancement, it can be a multi-tier acquisition. So the operating sub can be a way down from the target itself. Again, this structuring normally is for tax purposes. For example, if we have, we have this sub operating in a country, if we sell it directly, we would be exposed to capital gains. So the owners may not want to sell it to us. So when they structure it multi-tier and we buy the target, the target may be in BVI, may be in Cayman. So the seller would not need to incur capital gains tax. So I mentioned earlier on the M&A allowance is worth quite a lot of money, up to $5 million, because it is on the acquisition value. What is interesting is the minister has also now proposed a double deduction. Notice the M&A allowance is on acquisition cost. Now the minister has proposed to allow double deduction for fees incurred for legal fees and tax fees. My auditor friends ask me why is it they never add on financial UD fees. So my honest answer is that well tax people are actually worth more and the minister is trying to encourage tax people to stay in Singapore. In fact, some creative thinking, if you receive an acquisition job to do duty, financial duty and tax duty, usually it's packaged together. And they say, well, your your duty is say a hundred thousand. We can quite creatively say, well, actually, we actually spend a lot of time evaluating your tax exposures. So out of fifty thousand, forty-five is tax duty, five thousand so simple financial. 
you only spend 5,000 so that your client can get a double deduction for, for tax duty. And that also means that those specializing in tax should have better remuneration. <laughs> I've always believed tax has by, had higher value added, right? Now, capital gains on share divestment has always been an ongoing process that when we sell a capital asset, we have to explain to IRAs that it is capital, not taxable. So, to make it easier for investors, the Minister has proposed that if we hold equities for at least 24 months, i.e. two years, and we hold at least 20%, then on divestment, we do not need to answer to IRAs that it is capital gain. It will be seen to be capital gains. Question, what if our holding is less than 24 months, less than 20% or less than 24 months, then the normal badges of trade will come into play. So we still have to look at situations, circumstances, in, within which we had our acquisition and our disposals.